What do beards, orgasms, and fat politicians have in common? Um, I don't know, political corruption? Yeah, uh, but we're going to discuss them all in this segment. Uh, so our viewers will doubtless have heard of the Nobel Prize, an award given to commemorate the greatest scientific achievements in modern history. The intellectual titans of our age have produced inventions such as the blue LED, Shinji Nakamura, uh, CRISPR gene editing, Charpentier and Doudna, and lithium-ion batteries, good enough Whittingham and Yoshino. But there is a lesser known prize for scientific achievement, the Ig Nobel Prize, an award given to commemorate the dumbest scientific achievements in modern research. Often attended and awarded by Nobel Prize winners, the Ig Nobel Prize lies at the centre of scientists' attempts to persuade the world that they have a sense of humour. Some of this year's awards include studies on cat-human communication, genetic analysis of the wasted chewing gum bacterium, and the relationship between the smell of a cinema and the genre of film that was screened. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Today I've selected four utterly serious scientific studies that were awarded the Ig Nobel Prize in 2021. Let's go to the first one. Impact protection potential of mammalian hair, testing the pugilism hypothesis for the evolution of human facial hair. For our uh, lay readers, that means do beards protect you from punches? I guess somewhat, but not very much. I mean, uh, you've been punched quite a lot, haven't you? Is that uh, yeah, a few times. Uh, okay. Would you? Do you reckon it's it's more impactful when you have a beard or when you don't have a beard? I've only ever been hit in the nose, so it's, <sighs> unless my beard is really swallowing up my face, and mm. it's not really going to happen. Um, See that that seems to undermine the pugilism hypothesis, doesn't it? Because the nose is surely a more obvious target. It is. Yeah. It, it also hurts quite a lot getting hit there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read an extract from the abstract, which sounds like a tautology, but it's not. <laughs> um, so, because facial hair is one of the most sexually dimorphic features of humans, homo sapiens, and is often perceived as an indicator of masculinity and social dominance, human facial hair has been suggested to play a role in male contest competition. It'll Regret that I'm clean shaven. Yeah, things. we're both clean shaven. This is mm. this isn't fitting at all, is it? Some authors have proposed that the beard may function similar to the long hair of a lion's mane, serving to protect vital areas like the throat and jaw from lethal attacks. This is consistent with the observation that the mandible, which is superficially covered by the beard, is one of the most commonly fractured facial bones in interpersonal violence. Broken any jaws lately? I've never broken a jaw. Hmm. We hypothesize that beards protect the skin and bones of the face when human males fight by absorbing and dispersing the energy of blunt impact. We tested this hypothesis by measuring impact force and energy absorbed by a fiber epoxy composite which served as a bone analog when it was covered with skin that had thick hair, referred to here as furred, versus skin with no hair, referred to here as sheared and plucked. We covered the epoxy composite with sh segments of skin dissected from domestic sheep. Oh, oh this nice sheep skin. Yep. Of course. And used a drop weight impact tester affixed with a load cell to collect force versus time data. And uh, what they found was that fully furred samples were capable of absorbing more energy than plucked and sheared samples. For example, peak force was 16% greater and total energy absorbed 37% greater in the third compared to the plucked samples. Interesting. So this is just trying to tempt everyone to grow out beards, really. Pretty just much. In case. Uh, these data support the hypothesis, they claim, that human beards protect vulnerable regions of the facial skeleton from damaging strikes. I've always thought that if, if they served any role, it would be in hiding where your actual jawline mm. is. So if you... I mean, getting hit in the jaw is the best way to get knocked out, mm -hmm. and therefore hiding that is pretty essential, really. You think so, so I imagine that that would probably, even yeah. if this is true, it would contribute somewhat. I feel like testing, testing this in a static scenario, which is what they've done, actually tells us very little of use relating to their hypothesis, but I just think it's a hilarious study, and clearly the Ig Nobel Prize Awarders did too. Um, the next one is slightly more spicy. Are orgasms better than nasal decongestants? <laughs> uh, and you'll be amazed to find that the original pioneer of this field was had a close connection to Sigmund Freud. Oh, 
colour me surprised. I, I mean, I'm, just, I'm going to read an introdu- time, isn't it? a piece from the introduction and then summarise the study. Um, a physiological connection between the nose and the genitals has long been proposed. <laughs> Wilhelm Fleece, an, otor- an otolaryngologist practicing in, practicing in Berlin, was Sigmund Freud's closest friend and confidant. The theory of a reflex nasal neurosis was published by Fleece in 1897, postulating a physiological connection between the nose and the genitals. Specific genital spots, according to Fleece, located on the inferior nasal turbinates, played an important role in the nasogenital relation. Freud and Fleece elaborated on this theory in letters over the next years. Sigmund Freud, who underwent inferior turbinate surgery twice by Fleece, even referred publicist Emma Eckstein for surgery, whom he diagnosed with nasal reflex neurosis. I'm so glad right. Sigmund Freud It's not... My, uh, it's, People it's ask not me, why I'm, me why I'm critical of Freud and the psychoanalytic approach in general. Well, there it, we go. I mean, it gets what worse. more do we want? The surgery ended in a disaster, resulting in recurrent nasal bleeding and a disfigured nose. Bizarre theories of fleece of neurosis never held any scientific validity, and reports of the nasogenital relationship have since diminished in the medical literature. What a tragedy. I mean, it's a really... Really cutting edge, unexplored area that I just know. needs. But for some reason, these validation. authors felt that they had to study it as they set out their objectives, methods, and results here. Objectives. The study was conducted to examine the impact of sexual activity on nasal breathing and compare such effect to that of a nasal decongestant. Methods. We evaluated nasal breathing at five different times. One, before sexual activity, baseline. Two, immediately after sexual activity. 3. 30 minutes, 4. 1 hour, 5. and 3 hours after sexual climax. Same measurements were taken on the second day following application of nasal decongestant spray. For evaluation of nasal breathing, we used a visual analog scale. Additionally, we used a portable rhinometric device to measure resistance and nasal flow. Wait, so the methodology here was just someone in a lab coat in a corner watching people, you know... (laughs) It may. Right. They don't go into that level of detail, but that may have been it. It's so weird. Yep. <laughs> science is strange, man. Well, it's almost like there are people using science as an excuse to pursue other things. Well, it's <laughs> that's what I actually want this to be. Because if this is some kind of realistic endeavor for knowledge, I'm I'm even more worried. Really, I can believe that some scientists are perverts more than I mm-hmm. can believe that this is an actual. Yeah. So if we go to the graph, which is the result of the main results of this study, uh, so the dotted line shows nasal flow over time, and the uh, continuous line shows the results on the visual analog scale. And uh, you can see that actually both sex and nasal decongestants do result in an improvement in nasal flow in the short term. However, up between an hour and three hours after the activity, uh, the effect the uh, medical effect of sex diminishes back to the baseline very quickly, whereas nasal sprays have a more prolonged effect. Uh, So the conclusions are that sexual intercourse with climax can improve nasal breathing to the same degree as application of nasal decongestant for up to 60 minutes in patients having nasal obstruction. In other words, it's pretty useless as a medical intervention. But that won't stop some patients from trying. (laughs) (laughs) Oh dear. Aren't you glad you're, you're you're not a medic? Well, of course, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's why I'm a psychologist. We we just get to talk to people. We get to sit on a sofa. Mm-hmm. We don't have to look up their nose or watch them have sex like a weirdo in the corner with a little clipboard. Like, hmm, yes, very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and then dear. we have a, moving away into the field of politics and economics. We have a very curious study by Pavlo Blavatsky, which is a great name for a scientist. And uh, essentially, he's asking. Is there a link between the obesity of politicians and corruption in post-Soviet countries? Yes, there is. I don't How even need did to you see... know? Well, if you are on the large side, you're probably going to be greedy. A stereotype. By definition, you're going to be greedy. <laughs> um, and therefore, if you, if you don't have the self-control required to control your urge to put food in your mouth, then you're probably not going to control your urge to get some money under the table to buy said food either. Or otherwise indulge in the opportunities for corruption which are given to heads of state and that sort of thing. Interesting. Um, so let's, let's read the abstract. We should have that here. There we go. 
uh, we collected 299 frontal face images of 2017 cabinet ministers from 15 post-Soviet states. For each image, the minister's body mass index is estimated using a computer vision algorithm. The median estimated body mass index of cabinet ministers is highly correlated with conventional measures of corruption. Transparency International, World Bank, and... Uh, and they do look at one other. This result suggests that physical characteristics of politicians such as their body mass index can be used as proxy variables for political corruption when the latter are not available, for instance at a very local level. In other words, if you're concerned whether your leaders are corrupt, look at how fat they are. And if we look at their results in graphs, here you can see that there does seem to be a reasonable correlation here. Would you say? So... If I'm understanding this right, yep. uh, Turkmenistan, the least corrupt, Estonia the most. Is that uh, right? No, I think it's the opposite. Other way around. Great. Yes. I, I can't even read a graph. Four years no, to be fair, to be fair, the way they've labelled this is very counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Yes. But um, so Estonia is actually the least corrupt, and Turkmenistan, um, oh. Uzbekistan, are kind of the the most corrupt. I believe so. Yes. Um, okay. Which I find particularly interesting. So, mm. There you go. Um, and finally, I just thought I would end on a bit of zoology. Now look at this glorious title. Can you read that for us? The pulmonary and metabolic effect of suspension by the feet compared with the lateral recumbency in immobilized black rhinoceroses. Uh, Diceros by Cornus. Thank you. Uh, captured by aerial darting. So what do you reckon that means in layman's terms? Um, I imagine it's the strain on the... Uh, cardiovascular system of suspending rhinos by their feet um, rather than putting them sideways when you're transporting them when you've um, knocked them out with some kind of tranquilizer. Yep, very good. So is it better to airlift rhinoceros is the right way up or upside down? That, <laughs> I wish that was the title instead. <laughs> it, it, That's the most pretentious way of putting that <laughs> imaginable. And it's, it's only I four know. years of scientific education that I was able to translate well, that nonsense. Well, uh, there's something I notice about some scientists, which is that they like to make their language as complicated as possible. Sometimes they do it for accuracy, and sometimes they just do it to signal that it's complicated science. <laughs> um, I'll leave you to decide Usually which the this latter. is. Oh. Um, spoil it for you. So let's let's just run through the abstract quickly. Aerial translocation of captured black rhinoceroses, Deseros bicornis, has been accomplished by suspending them by their feet. We expected this posture would compromise respiratory gas exchange more than would lateral recumbency. Because white rhinoceros, this is Ceratotherium simum, immobilized with etorphine alone, are hypermetabolic, with a high rate of carbon dioxide production, we expected immobilized black rhinoceroses would also have a high VCO2. And they run through their results. They tested on uh, 12 specimens, 9 male and 3 female, and some of them were kept on their side, others were suspended by their feet, and they measured these components of their metabolic rate. Uh, suspension by the feet for 10 minutes did not impair pulmonary function more than did lateral recumbency, and apparently augmented gas exchange to a small degree relative to lateral recumbency. The biological importance in these animals of numerically small increments in PaO2 and decrements in PaCO2 with suspension by the feet is unknown. Black rhinoceroses immobilized with etorphine and azaparone were not as hypermetabolic as were white rhinoceroses Rhinoc rhinoceros, I can't say rhinoceroses. Rhinoceroses. There we go. Immobilized with etorphine. That seems like a long-winded way of saying it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> well, that's that's taken a, a weight off my mind. Next Excellent. time I am transporting rhinoceroses, I will not be so uh, paranoid as I, I often am mm -hmm. with which way up I'm going to put them. I, I can just let them lie however they wish. Scientists, solving your everyday problems. <laughs> if you enjoyed that segment from the podcast The Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com and check out all the premium content we have on the site, such as this article from John Tangney on the IQ and the regressive left, which comes with an audio cover for silver and gold tier members, in case you don't like reading. I can very much sympathize. If you'd like to find out what else is coming out on the website, you can always follow us on Getter at getter.com with lotuseaters underscore com being the at. Thank you and goodbye.